Welcome to Demystifying Science. Today on the show, we have NASA scientist Dr. Nikki Fox, who works on the Parker Solar Probe. The probe is named for Dr. Eugene Parker, who brought us the term solar wind, from what I understand. And the solar wind is a really exciting topic for me because it seems like it's increasingly important on Earth, especially as we become more technological, as the climate appears to be something that is somewhat within our control. And what I really want to understand first is how we came up with this idea. What did science before Dr. Parker came up with this idea or unified this idea? What did the what were people thinking about the sun? And yeah, how did we get here? So I, I think, you know, we, we thought the sun was a obviously we knew the star at the sun was a star. We knew it, it, it you know it had various um, different features. We knew it was it was dynamic, um, but I don't think we really understood the profound um, link between the sun and all of the planets um, that in the solar system that we actually live in the extended atmosphere of the sun. So I don't think there was a really good appreciation of how far out that solar atmosphere really expanded. You, know, you can see it during a total solar eclipse and you can see um, that hazy atmosphere, the corona, but the idea that the corona stretches out all the way to the edge of our heliosphere um, and that the, the, this solar wind, this continual stream of what's coming from the sun towards us, it, do, it doesn't stop. It's continually expanding. Um, also, even, even if folks sort of understood maybe that it, it expanded, the idea that it was continually accelerated. So it wasn't just um, ex sort of expanding and then just cooling down as you would expect it to do. If you, you know, if you pump a, the gas in the car, it speeds up. If you take your foot off the gas, it will eventually slow down and stop. The solar wind doesn't. It continually um, gets accelerated. So it, it bathes all of the planets. And um, th I think that was, you know, a, bit, a real sort of turning point for us when we realized exactly how um, the corona and how all that solar material was really getting to us here at Earth. And what's basically going on there? So what? let's start with like how the solar wind is produced. Essentially, there's this heating process in the atmosphere, which is somewhat under investigation, but it's at odds with gravity, which is trying to keep all of this solar atmosphere near the, near the center, the, the very center of the sun. So there's this tug of war. And is that what, as gravity weakens, the further it's away, is that why the acceleration, uh, or that, is that why the, the material is accelerating or what's going on there? So that's a really, that's a really interesting question with a lot in that. <laughs> okay. Actually. Um, so I mean, if we sort of break it down, it's really more like the coronal heating problem. Um, and it's one of the longest running solar physics puzzles. Mm. And it's still highly, highly controversial. You know, a lot of progress has been made to this is really understanding why the corona is so much hotter than the surface of the sun. So what happens in that region that causes this huge heating? And we're talking about a difference of the solar surface is 6,000 K and the corona is around 2 million K. Absolutely. Yes. So we call that the coronal heating problem because it, you know, it doesn't initially, it doesn't really make sense. If you, you know, you've got this really big solar core, um, generating a ton of heat. And as you're moving away from it, you would expect just like you would from a campfire that the temperature would drop. Whereas we find in stars and, and our, our star is not unique in this. Um, we've seen many other stars. Um, you look at them in certain ways, you can see they also have Corona around them. And so, you know, there's a, a, a fundamentally, it doesn't make sense. You know, what is going on? What are the processes that are happening that are causing this heating to happen in the Corona? Where we see this um, sort of maximum in the heating, that's where we see the solar wind kind of get born. That's where um, the acceleration, whatever process, it's probably heating and accelerating the solar wind actually then causes it to get so much energy that it actually can break away from that giant pole of the star. And so that they're sort of, they're linked. The, the actual what's causing the heating and what's causing the acceleration, it's in the same region, there's going to be very similar processes that are happening. So there's kind of a link between the two. But the, this coronal heating, it's, it's really one of the longest running puzzles in solar physics. And um, it's still really, really controversial. Um, a lot of progress has been made in sort of modeling the possible heating mechanisms. 
but it's very hard to discriminate um, among them to discover if, if, you know, which one is really the dominant process. Mm. And so, you know, that is why we are flying missions like Parker Solar Probe to actually go into this region, to go into the region where the corona is getting heated and accelerating to really measure what processes are going on in, you know, there. And is it is the probe also looking at the surface and and sort of examining our understanding of the temperature that's happening at the surface? Because because it, it, could it be possible that the reason that there's a difference in temperature between the the apparent surface temperature of the sun and the coronal temperature is because our interpretation of the sun's temperature isn't perfect? No, I, I don't think so. I, I think we've got a pretty good handle on the, the temperature of the surface of the sun and a good understanding of, you know, the processes that, that happen from the core um, that actually, you know, get uh, get the energy and the light energy out to the surface of the sun. Um, Parker Solar Probe is really focusing on the corona, on this region. That, um, this It's it's a transition region. Um, many different sort of transition points happen in the corona. Um the one is that when you see um, the sun rotating very close to the sun inside this transition region, the corona, all of the, the loops of plasma, all of the really bright um, stuff that you can see in our, in our images, um, it's all rotating as sort of one solid body. But in, the, in this transition region, that is where the heating is happening, the acceleration is happening, and the, the solar wind now, or the corona, this, this piece of the corona, instead of actually rotating as a solid body, it actually gets accelerated and it moves radially away from the sun. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's kind of like a, a sprinkler, garden sprinkler effect, um, where as the, as the sun is rotating, um, the, the the bit very close is is rotating with the sun, and then just a little bit further out, it starts to to go um, in a in a radial direction. So it, it's got that sort of garden sprinkler kind of um, shape to the solar wind. And this is synonymous with the heliospheric current sheath, from what I understand. This is this idea that there's just a big blanket of material, like charged material, that's I guess it's conductive, um, all the way out in the plane of the planets and not sure what the t scientific term for that is, but um, yeah. So it the sun has a magnetic field, um, and in so, uh, solar minimum. So um, we're kind of doing a lot in this this one answer, but um, it's solar minimum. The the sun's magnetic field is kind of a, in a north south direction, so very similar to what we have here on Earth, um, and. So you have field lines that are coming out from the top of the sun. They have one polarity the, you know, the, the polarity is in one direction and then they come back and the, you know, the, the field lines go in at the other pole of the sun and every 11 years um, they switch. Uh, so that's, that's called solar maximum is when um, kind of it's the most chaotic and then it goes back to solar minimum. And in that time, um, the, the solar field actually flips in polarity. So you've got, um, uh, field lines of one polarity coming out of one pole and field lines of another of the opposite polarity going in to um, the, the bottom or into the, the other pole. And so if you can kind of picture it, um, you're, as you stretch the fields away from the sun, you're going to have um, field lines pointing in one direction on one side and the other direction coming back. And the heliospheric current sheet is basically the layer between those two um, magnetic field regions, um, sort of broadly speaking. Um, and so above the heliospheric current sheet, you'll see mostly fields of one polarity and beneath the heliospheric current sheet, you see the, um, the magnetic field pointing in the opposite direction. Mm. And our planets are kind of sandwiched in there too. Yes. So our planets sit um, really in that sort of equatorial region. Um, so, you know, right where the equator of the sun is, um, that's where the, our, our planets are all sort of rotating around in that plane. Now, is that significant? Is, is that somehow, I've always wondered about this, you know, the, the idea that so many of these structures, these cosmic structures have this pancake shape. Uh, I'm sure there's a gravitational explanation for why the planets are all in a disk. 
Uh, but is it significant that the that they're sandwiched in between the two? I don't know what you call them polarity f- uh, regions of the of the current sheath. I, I I don't think it's particularly sig- significant, other than you know it, it's kind of the it's the easiest place for them to rotate around. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if you also remember that not only are our planets uh, rotating and orbiting around our sun, but our entire solar system is orbiting around the Milky Way. And so as the Milky, you know, we're, we're, we are in one of the spiral arms of the Milky Way. And as the Milky Way is kind of cartwheeling around, um, our our whole solar system is also orbiting. And so um, we also form a weird sort of shape in interstellar space. And that shape um, is carved out for us by our solar wind. This is one of the reasons the solar wind is so interesting, um, is not only is, you know, do we think about it being close to the sun, but if you go all the way out to the very edge of our heliosphere, and the heliosphere is just a fancy name for basically our place in space. Um, so the sun is, is kind of the center of our heliosphere. And then as the solar wind um, stretches out, it kind of carves out um, a sort of cavity for us as we are rotating around the Milky Way. And so it actually protects us from the vagaries of interstellar space. But because it's moving, it also forms, it's sort of like a windsock shape. So the the front of our heliosphere um, is kind of like a nose shape. And then the the rest of it is pulled out into a sort of a longer tail Mm -hmm. um, on the other side. And so that actually, if you think about um, what our Earth's magnetosphere looks like, um, it's a cavity. Our magnetic field in the solar wind forms a protective bubble around our planet. The solar wind is essentially doing that for the whole um, of our heliosphere and forming that sort of windsock shape as we move around. Now, is that windsock pointed at the interior of the galaxy, sort of like a comet's pointed at the sun, or is it dragging behind us as we're moving through the galaxy's rotation? Which is it? I'm not. It's dragging behind us as we move through the galaxy's rotation. Nice. And so, um, if you again, if you think of, of what our magnetosphere looks like, um, so if you take our, our um, Earth magnetic field, and then if you just drew like a regular dipole field around the Earth, um, it will be uniform. Now, if you put that in a turbulent flow, like the solar wind, um, just like if you put a boulder in a stream, and that you know you have a, a laminar flow coming down towards you, you'll get um, sort of like a shock on one side and a compressed thing, and then you get like a turbulent tail mm. that forms behind that boulder in the stream. That is exactly what um, our Earth is doing to the solar wind. It's an obstacle in the solar wind, and so our you know uh, flow, radial flow that is now coming away from the sun, is impacting our our Earth and kind of forming this comet-shaped tail. So it's very similar to the shape of a comet, but instead of pointing in towards the center, it's it's basically being dragged around by the motion of, of the Milky Way. And when the reversal of the sun's magnetic field happens, how does that affect the solar wind? Oh, it, it does affect the solar wind. Um, and and it, it's quite a complicated answer. Um, so if you look at the sun, um, on obviously not with your naked eye, but if you look at the sun on um, on the computer and you look at it in visible um, wavelengths, it looks like a very sort of uniform sphere. And then you see some dark splotches um, on the surface of the sun and they are sunspots. And as the uh, solar cycle progresses, the number of sunspots changes. So um, the maximum number of sunspots is solar maximum. So that's kind of when the field is most um confused. It's about ready to to flip at that point. And then when you see the minimum number of sunspots, that's solar minimum. And that's literally how we characterize a solar cycle by counting the number of sunspots that are visible on the disk at any one time. And does the solar wind emerge from the sunspots? Different solar wind comes from different areas. Um, And the, so at the poles, we tend to see very fast solar wind because that's associated with magnetic field lines that are open. So they've they've only got one footprint on the sun and the others are sort of open. If you think about um, the really spectacular images that you see from NASA of the sun and you see sort of loops of, of bright, it's actually magnetic, they are magnetic field lines. And so both feet are anchored on the sun. So that's closed 
um, field lines that's associated with slower solar wind. And so when you have a solar minimum, you see a lot more of the, the, the wind coming from the poles and kind of draping down out into the equatorial region. So we see a lot of fast solar wind at, um, solar maximum, we see a much more of a mix of, of fast and slow solar wind. And, you know, that can cause almost like a friction or a turbulence because you have one, one flow going faster than another. You can just imagine, you know, what, what happens if you inject fast moving water into a slower moving stream, you'll get all kinds of, of, um, uh, sort of effects as they mingle with one another. Um, also at solar maximum, because we have a lot of sunspots with these big um, magnetic field lines in them, they can actually stretch and break and throw billions of tons of coronal material out um, away from the sun, uh, you know, moving at millions of miles an hour. We call those coronal mass ejections um, because they literally are masses of coronal material ejected out into space. And so, you know, at solar maximum, we're seeing a lot of mixtures of different types of solar wind. So, yes, it does have a very big effect on what we see in the solar wind. Mm -hmm. And if I could if I could ask about sunspots, which is sort of a tangential question, I've always been perplexed by the fact that sunspots are dark. Can, do you do you sort of does does NASA, do scientists have good insight onto why? you would open the atmosphere of the sun and see something darker beneath it? So it's actually um, because the, the plasma itself associated with the sunspot, so it's very, their pockets of much more intense magnetic field um, and they actually constrain the plasma at a lower altitude. Um, so it's lower down in the corona. So it's literally a cooler um, area that the plasma is constrained in. Um, they're actually incredibly um, active, very, very strong magnetic field. Um, sometimes if you see a, a sunspot that's about to erupt, it looks like kind of a slinky spring that, uh, that appears um, in the, around the sunspot. And that's the sort of the magnetic field. It looks like a, maybe we call them flux ropes, but um, it's like a, you know, it literally is like a, a spring um, coiled around and it stretches and then it breaks and lets all of this material out. So even though uh, they look dark just because they're actually constrained closer to the surface of the sun, lower down in the corona. And um, that's that's how we uh, that's why they're dark, because they're actually just cooler areas of plasma. Hmm. One, one question I, I hear a lot that's kind of difficult to, to answer, maybe you can take a crack at it, is why does this really hot atmosphere not heat up the surface uh, layer below it? Like if you took a, you know, you put your hand on an oven, your hand would maybe get burnt or something like that. But can you, can you help us understand that a little bit? Yes. So that's, that's a really great, so that there's a couple of things in the question. Um, so, you know, one, uh, you know, why doesn't it actually sort of turn around and heat up the surface of the sun? It's basically because um, the solar wind is continually flowing outwards. So once the solar wind crosses this transition region, we call it an alphane point or an alphane surface. It's where um, the, the plasma stops being constrained and orbiting around with the sun or rotating around with the sun, sorry, um, and then actually breaks away and, and forms the solar wind. So once the... Um, the, the coronal plasma itself crosses this transition point, it never returns to the sun. So the surface and the properties of that solar wind are kind of determined right there. Uh, I'd like how much mass, how much energy, how much angular momentum, everything is, is kind of determined right there. And then it, it moves out into space. So there's no sort of way for this incredibly hot corona to kind of come back mm. and circulate and sort of um, maybe equalize the temperature between the surface of the sun mm. and the corona itself. Um, now, why why it doesn't feel super hot? Um, and, and it actually is a question we get a lot about Parker Solar Probe when we talk about how you know the front. Um, the, the surface of the front side of the heat shield on there, because the, the spacecraft itself is actually orbiting through this, you know, million degree corona. Um, but we only have only have to face temperatures of about 1400 degrees Celsius on the front side of our heat shield. Hmm. And that's really because even though the, you know, the bulk temperature of the plasma is, is millions of degrees, 
there aren't that many particles in it. So it's not very dense. Mm. And so it is very much like putting your hand inside an oven. And I say this carefully, don't touch anything. (laughs) if If you turn your oven on and you've got it at like 400 degrees Fahrenheit, 200 degrees Celsius, um, and you put your hand inside the oven, you can hold your hand in that heat for a long time without actually getting burned. The only time you'll get burned is if you touch the surface of the oven. And now you've actually got a full contact. Um, and now that, you know, the heat can actually transfer into your fingers and cause a lot of pain. In the solar wind, it's very similar. There are just not that many particles. So the number of particles that actually couple into the spacecraft in this in this case are very few and so there's very little heat actually transferred Mm. from the particles most of the heat that we face is from the photons or from the incredible light because we're so close to the sun so even though the whole plasma itself um you know is at three million degrees there aren't just that many touch points to really um put the temperature into or put the heat sorry into uh into the spacecraft so it's kind of the difference in temperature and heat Mm. And so, yeah, my question was, how how is this measured and how is this determined? So you're saying that it's only encountering temperatures of 1400 degrees Celsius, but yet you look at the corona and it's 2 million Kelvin. What is the difference in... Like, how do people know it's 2 million degrees? Yeah, how do you know that it's 2 million versus 1400 now that you're actually there? And you're like, well, it does seem a lot closer well, to 1400. I think they, they, and they understood that from what I understand. This is kind of what went into Eugene Parker's creation of this solar wind theory in the, in the first place was that they understood the corona to be so hot to begin with. How, how did they know that without ever touching it? So they actually uh, knew that from, um, from measurements that were taken during a total solar eclipse. Um, and they actually looked and, and found that, um, so they, 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 well, okay. So they used a spectrograph to uh, look at the light in the corona. And they did that during um, a total solar eclipse. And at first, um, it was thought that that maybe this was a new material. So uh, it wasn't... um, Coronium, right? Yes, it did not have the same (laughs) spectral signature as anything that existed here on Earth. So, you know, it's not like you looked at something and said, ah, that's oxygen or mm. ah, that's, you know, sodium. It didn't look like anything that we had here on Earth. Um, and so the scientists who discovered this actually named it, you're quite quite right, named it coronium, thinking that, um, okay, great, we found this new element. Um, however, there were, you know, others, it was, a, a, again, a very um, controversial discussion over was this really a new element or was it actually something that did exist that we knew about, but it, the only way it could have that particular spectral signature was for it to be super, super heated or super highly ionized. And so then, it, you know, it, it, they, the work demonstrated that um, the temperature had to be in, the ex, in excess of, of a million degrees Kelvin in order to ionize and it's actually an iron line um, that, uh, that that was used in order to ionize it. I think it needed to, um, you know, strip off 14, 15 electrons to make it um, have that exact spectral signature. And the only way that could happen was for the temperature to be in excess of a million degrees. So that's how um, it was measured and known that the corona is that hot. Um, that is the temperature of the corona. Again, Temperature and heat transfer are different. So in order to actually transfer heat from that um, sort of cloud, if you like, of plasma that, that is the, cor- uh, the corona, you actually need to, 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 to physically couple. Um, and there just aren't that many particles. So even though the individual particles are all at 3 million degrees, you are not encountering that many particles because you're not actually, you know, that it's just not that dense. So again, it's like, just like an oven. You can put your hand in 200 degrees Celsius oven, as long as you don't touch the racks or the sides of the oven, you can hold your hand in there because you're in the, uh, you know, a not very dense, um, you're just in air. You really, if you, but the moment you touch the side of the oven, you couple into all of that heat. And, and that's when you, you, you have a problem. And so if the probe was to go closer into the sun and closer to the surface, would it hit a point at some place where it was registering 2 million degrees? Or would it always be so rarefied that it would always be sensed as being lower? 
um, than what is calculated. So we can measure the temperature of the individual particles and they are at, at millions of degrees. So we have, uh, we carry you know, instruments that actually um, measure that the, they're sensitive to the individual particles. So and the, I can absolutely say that the, the, the individual particles that make up the corona are at 3 million degrees. This is like an electrical measure? Yeah, because I was, I was always, I'm, I guess I'm kind of unclear on this, because I thought that temperature was a bulk measurement of, you have like a container and it's the, the sort of the movement of the molecules that are inside of the container and that gives you the, the temperature. That's, How do you measure a single particle and tell its temperature? That's fascinating. Yeah. Yes, you can. Um, but you, but you, I mean, you, yes, it is a bulk measurement, but again, it's the difference in temperature and heat and heat is energy. Temperature is, is, is a bulk measurement. So the, all the individual particles are at this, at this temperature, the, the, the sort of gas cloud is at that temperature, just like the gas cloud in your oven is at 200 degrees Celsius. It's a heat transfer issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. So, I wanted to go back to the history a little bit and try to understand what made this so difficult to swallow at first. Because when I was looking into this, it seemed like the original paper that Dr. Parker wrote uh, was slated to be rejected by two of the three reviewers and was saved at the last minute by the journal's editor, who is uh, Chandra Sekhar. So why was this so why why are these paradigm shifts so difficult in science like what what was happening there that led to this tension why would what what made it an unattractive idea do you have any sense of that because it hadn't been predicted before um you know I, there there were many other papers that had been written about you know what what the uh, the extended atmosphere of the sun what, what was going on there. There were many sort of um, theories and proposals and hypotheses that had been suggested because at this point, remember that um, folks knew that the, that the corona was about 300 times hotter than the surface of the sun. And so, you know, you've got people trying to explain why that happens. Um, the explanation that, that Gene Parker came up with was very different to uh, the, the ones that maybe were more mainstream or more... Yeah, can you give us a sense of some of those alternative explanations uh, that, that maybe uh, Dr. Parker was fighting back against? It's not so much that it's so. I'll, I'll, yeah, so I'll, I'll maybe it's it. not the right wording. I'm sorry. It's not like a. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, he he um, I his best description of it was was he said you know I I just solved a few equations, and so he basically wrote down the equations of state and and found a you know a, a there was actually I think six different curves that that were plotted on in his figure um and he showed you know that th these were all ones that would would satisfy all of these equations but there was only one that was um that was sort of real in nature so you know one had had everything going back into the sun well that we know that doesn't work because we know that we you know you, we 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 get stuff from the sun. So we know it's moving away from the sun. And then there was one that, you know, um, I think it broke the law of, I can't remember them all now, but um, one was called the solar breeze because it, it, it would have just sort of moved out very slowly. And so there were, he, he basically found this, um, this set of solutions for, um, for a string of, of equations. And, you know, he just, he sort of shrugs and is quite, um, demure about the whole thing and says, I just solved a few equations, you know, but um, that, that was, he, he just said, I, I looked at, at um, mathematically what, what could be happening in the Corona. And, and he, so that, that's how he proposed that um, this, it was continually expanding, continually accelerating. And, and the big thing that he was saying was that the, the Corona would still be being accelerated as it was um, further away from the sun. And that was, uh, you know, that was one of the big sticking points that the other, other scientists did not believe. They thought it was just sort of a, you know, it, it would accelerate away, but then it would be moving much slower um, when it, certainly when it reached Earth, um, it would be moving much slower. Uh, I think a year or two after um, Gene published the paper, um, it was discovered using Mariner data that, in fact, the, the solar wind was much um, faster than these other theories would have predicted. And so it became clear that Gene was right and that the corona was being accelerated and, and some processes were going on that were continually accelerating it 
and and that was why it was moving faster when it got to the Earth than other scientists had thought of. You you said something interesting about the idea that people already knew that the sun was impacting the Earth by the time that uh, Dr. Parker was working on his theories. And I just had kind of an idle thought. When did people realize that the sun was impacting Earth? So <laughs> it's it's actually surprising to me that we didn't realize it much earlier, but it, it was the Carrington event. So the very famous um, wow. Carrington event was the first time that people realized just how much the earth was um, really impacted by the sun. And that was like 1930? So, I think it was the 18th. 18, yeah. 18. 1814, uh, 1859, 1859, yeah. Yeah. And Carrington was sketching sunspots, which he did every day. He had a, tele- a brass telescope um, and sort of uh, projected the surface of the sun, and he was sketching the sun, the location of the sunspots. It was a very big sunspot group that had been moving across the surface of the, the or moving, you know, around with the sun. And while he was actually sketching them, he actually saw like bright, he described it as bright white flashes of light on this, you know, around this, this sunspot. And he ran away to get a, a colleague to, to come and look and see what, you know, go, look, look at what I've just seen kind of thing. But the, uh, the activity had died down um, in a few minutes, so didn't really think too much more about it. Um, but then just hours after um, he saw that event, the, uh, the compass needles at the Earth began to sort of, you know, oscillate. Um, and uh, the aurora were seen um, down at much lower latitudes than we would normally see them. Um, and the, um, the telegraph system in the U.S., actually sparks kind of flew from it and the telegraph system collapsed. And that was really the first time that people realized that something that happened on the sun has a profound effect on us here at Earth. And how susceptible, how how exposed are we to these sort of threats at this point? Because, you know, telegraphs are one thing, but we have an entire technological <laughs> civilization built on satellite communication and this is the disaster portion of the podcast uh, just i'm just curious <laughs> yeah i mean i assume that you know part of the work that nasa is doing i hope that part of the work that nasa is doing with regard to the parker solar probe is understanding this solar wind so that we can better protect ourselves uh yeah so what what's going what's going on today with the solar wind and our civilization absolutely absolutely so we call that space weather and uh, one of the, the big things we do here at NASA is do um, sort of the cutting edge research. We're sort of pushing the boundaries on what we know about the sun and its and its effect here on Earth, really to allow us to better predict and forecast these events. You absolutely nailed it. 1859, a telegraph system goes down. That was bad. You know, now, if we had that kind of event, power grids, um, you know, it, they, it certainly will affect power grids affects spacecraft on orbit. Um, it affects uh, you, you know all kinds of things that we rely on, GPS accuracy. Um, you know, just think if you go somewhere now, you don't take a map, you know, you don't I, you get on a plane, you use your phone for your airline ticket to to find your rental car, to find your hotel, everything you do is is in that that little piece of technology. And, and yes, we are so reliant on technology that now we were much, much, much more susceptible to the sun. And what sort of remediations are being imagined? I'm afraid you're are, not going to like that answer. Are there <laughs> tiny little uh, solar shields that we can stick on all of the satellites? Or, you know, what, are there any bright ideas about how we can protect ourselves? Because there's been some crazy flares just in the last few days, right? Yes, yes, the sun is waking up. We are, um, we've had solar minimum. We are on our way to the next solar maximum. Uh, we've seen some very nice events in uh, in the last few weeks. Um, so, in terms of of protecting yourself, the best thing you can do is actually know something is coming. And so, for example, if you have a power grid and you know there's a really big event and you are in the region of the earth that will be the most susceptible. So coming around towards the midnight region sounds counterintuitive, but that is the danger zone. Mm -hmm. Um, The energy sort of enters at the front, then it gets um, 
swept around and it goes into our tail region and mm. then injected in towards us. So it's really around the midnight region that is most susceptible. So if you know you're coming around to there and there's a lot of activity going on, one thing you can do is you can, uh, um, well, you can actually do sort of an orderly shutdown of a power grid or an orderly shutdown of a system. So you actually protect it and then bring it back up after the event has happened. If you don't know it's going to happen and it hits, you'll get a catastrophic failure, just like um, in 1989 in Hydro-Quebec, when that power grid completely failed, knocking out power to over 6 million people. And, and the whole grid went down in a matter of minutes. And this was a solar event? This was a solar event. I had no idea. Yes. Fascinating. Yeah. What kind of lead time are we talking about? Like, what's our early warning system with this? Or how long does it take the the, the bad stuff to get here? <laughs> um, so uh, as a solar scientist, I'll tell you, I think it's the good stuff. But... The good stuff. <laughs> the yeah. good, dangerous stuff. Yeah. It's a beautiful gray white shark. Of a, yeah. <laughs> um, but so the, the very big, powerful events um, are traveling a, a really good speed. Um, the solar wind itself travels at about a million miles an hour. So at 93 million miles. Um, it takes 93 hours, roughly, for anything leaving the sun to reach us here at Earth. That's not too bad. That's three, you know, three and a half days. The big solar events um, are traveling two to four times that speed. And so it is possible for an event to get to us within a day. Mm. Now, we see it. First of all, um, we can see, number one, we have scientists um, that are, are looking, they'll see the, the sunspot group coming around. It looks like it's going to erupt. It's very active. You are going to predict that that thing could erupt. When it does erupt, um, if it's coming straight towards us here at Earth, the event itself, um, when you look in a coronagraph, so if you take, if you think of like an a, a, a 24 7 eclipse, so flying an occulter disc in the front of a camera, so we can actually look at that um, corona all the time. The actual shape of the event, it looks like kind of a halo event getting bigger around the sun. If it's completely circular around the sun, that's coming directly towards us. So you can sort of, you, that now you've got maybe two days, two to three days to predict that's going to come. The final warning that really tells us how geo effective or how, you know, just how effective this um, event is going to be sitting a million miles upstream of the earth. That is called the Lagrange point, and that's where the um, the two uh, magnetic fields kind of cancel out of the Earth and the the. So it's sort of it's it's like a natural place that it will sit, um, and and so um, that's where we have a couple of our uh, upstream monitors, and they sit um, at this or they orbit around this little Lagrange point, and uh, they they are sitting there basically telling us exactly what is about to hit us. It's about an hour. Um, can be 30 minutes, can be only 20 minutes, depending how fast it's moving. But once we see that, we can see um, there are certain characteristics we look for in the magnetic field shape, in the speed, in the density, that will tell us a real prediction of how worried um, anyone should be. Would a significantly large pulse knock those, those satellites out? Like, would they just go dark if they get hit by something that's a Carrington-level event, or are they actually capable of sort of surfing that and being able to transmit stuff back? So we designed the spacecraft to be tough and, and to, that's really... uh, to be able to withstand um, what comes. I mean, you know, these the spacecraft are, they've been there for a long time. Um, they we're getting ready to launch uh, with the, the actually NOAA, the National Oceanographic um, Atmospheric Agency, they have um, the the sort of responsibility to actually do the prediction um, for the the US of everything that you know that we we might have to see, might have to deal with for space weather, and so we're actually getting ready to launch for them uh, a new spacecraft that will go out to that Lagrange point and and replace uh, the older ones that are there, um, and actually NASA is putting a research satellite out there also um, that is going to have a sort of dual thing. It's going to be measuring everything coming from the sun and, and then impacting us. And it's also got some really innovative ways of looking at um, the heliospheric boundary. So that mm. tenuous boundary between our solar wind and interstellar space 
and and kind of looking at, at everything that's coming in from interstellar space. And so those two spacecraft will go out to the Lagrange point and provide um, more early warning um, for us. Because the and the relevance of the looking towards interstellar space is that something could come from outside the solar system that is worth being concerned about. Is that kind of what you're saying? Um, not for this particular mission. Mm-hmm. We're really looking with this is focusing on um, on the just what how the boundary um, is changing, what the edge, basically what the edge of our sun's sphere of influence, what that boundary mm-hmm really looks like. Um, it's turned out to be more interesting than people may have thought originally. It's got some some interesting shapes on it. And so you have to kind of, um, I'm sorry, when I say shape, I mean, it's the magnetic field has a very interesting shape. Um, and, and it's, you know, we're seeing interstellar fields with our own fields. And it, it's just a very interesting boundary um, for us to study. Is it, sorry, one more question. Is this effectively an exclusion boundary? Are there a lot of things inside of our solar system that are from other solar systems? Do we have a sense of that? Um, So it's a long way to the next star. Um, So it's really what's in interstellar space. Um, But there are things like cosmic rays um, and, and various other things that do come from outside our solar system that come in. Um, But most of our stuff is is fairly constrained in our solar system. Interesting. Uh, bef- I do want to ask you about what comes next in terms of our understanding with the sun um, in this mission in particular and future missions. But before that, uh, before we move past sort of space weather and the Earth, I'm curious what effect this paradigm might have on the climate. Do you have any sense of that? Because it seems like, uh, per, you know, controlling our climate is of utmost concern right now. We have, I think, 60% of the population lives within like 100 miles of the coast or something like that. Uh, it's it's a very delicate ecosystem that we thrive in right now. Does, does the sp- solar wind and space weather play into that? How, has it played into it historically? Is this an unknown do you have any sense of that? So on a, you know, on a typical solar cycle of 11 years, you do see some effect um, on, but, but not, not, not a lot because they tend to be more transient events. So you can see some trends. If you look at um, the growth in trees, you can see sort of a solar cycle effect in the tree rings. So they do, there, there is some effect. So there's tend to be sort of a large scale Things that we we maybe can can um, do a one to one correlation in uh, the Monda minimum that happened in the eighteen hundreds. Um, these are like the super cycles. There's like these small cycles, ten years, and then there's these bigger cycles. Uh, I don't know how long those are. So, well, the, I mean, a full solar cycle, really strictly speaking, is twenty two years because mm. we talk about it as an eleven year because that's a pole flip. But twenty two is coming right back to how it was before. Um, but there was a period. Um, in the, I think the 1800s, when um, there were no sunspots on the sun for a long time, the earth was plunged into like a mini ice age. Um, the, you know, the River Thames in, in London froze. Mm. Um, and so that was a, that there was definitely a, a cooling of, the, of the, the, the temperature here on earth. And that correlated with no sunspots on the sun. But um, it's, it's not going to be as simple as if there's a big coronal mass ejection, you know, then there's going to be a sudden change in the temperature of our planet. It's it's a much more gradual thing that it's almost like breathing with the solar cycle. And I guess I'm curious about those bigger cycles, like uh, this minimum that was observed. Are there? Do you think that there are larger patterns that will emerge the longer we look, we study the sun? Like, how long have people been observing the sunspot patterns, and how much do we know about these larger? Uh, cycles and you know to the extent that they could contribute to different cl- climate cycles and climate patterns so i think it depends on how obvious it is um so th- this sounds like a really trite answer but you know you actually need to to observe for a long time to see one of these super cycles so you know wh- when you're in it you don't necessarily know you're in it you know um it, it's more when you look historically like okay well look at that particular thing that's one sort of cycle um so it's it's tough to actually kind of do that 
quickly, you know, you really do need to keep doing all of the um, the observations we have been doing. Now, people have been counting sunspots for a long, long time. Um, you can look back at the historical records of sunspot numbers and you can see they go back a long time. Obviously, we, we have more accurate ways and more sensitive ways of being able to count sunspots now um, than maybe we could um, earlier. So you can, you know, you can sort of group sunspot cycles together. But again, if, you know, right now, I couldn't tell you if we're in the middle of a, like where we are in a long cycle, because you need to be mm. on the other side of it. And then you can look back and say, okay, yes, this is a really long cycle. So we'll, ch- we'll check back in a thousand years on that one. <laughs> That'd be great. Yes, I'll put it on my calendar. <laughs> uh, so what's next? What kind of information do you hope to conclude with this study or what other studies do you imagine launching after this to follow up on what you've learned in this mission? Well, I mean, certainly with Parker Solar Probe, we we got new results and exciting results much quicker than we thought we would. Um, so it's a, a interesting, we, we get close closer to the sun by flying past Venus on um, uh, we actually will do it seven times and it kind of trims our orbit and lets us walk closer and closer to the sun. And so the, the whole mission was, was really designed on getting to within 10 solar radii, because that was sort of where a lot of predictions at the time of where this transition region, where this alphane surface, where, you know, everything, where the magic happens, um, that was thought to be close to, to 10 solar radii. And so the whole mission is designed to get to that distance. On our very first orbit, when we were nowhere near that close, uh, we started seeing some very unusual things. We saw these little um, features in the magnetic field that that we're now calling them switchbacks. They look like S-shaped curves in the magnetic field, which means that the whole field is sort of flowing back into the sun and then coming back out again with this sort of kink in it. Um, We found those um, further away from the sun than we had expected. Um, We also, um, on the last orbit, um, dipped down below this alphane surface. And so this, this transition region, the spacecraft was actually flying through um, the, the, the inside of this region. So, um, what, what, what do you mean by surface, by the way? Is this just an interface between two different types of matter? Um, well, it's really the, tra- so we call it a surface because it isn't, it isn't really a point, you know, it's, it's a, it's a whole surface. Um, but it's, it's this transition region where we go from a constrained plasma that's rotating with the sun to free plasma that's, that's accelerating radially outwards. Mm. So this, this region here, we call that the alphane surface. So it's like that, a behavioral change. Yeah, is that plasma. constrained plasma like more liquid-like or what's, what's it, how is it behaving? It's kind of, uni- it, it's homogenous in a way, I suppose? On the, on the, on the sun side of this boundary, um, it, the, everything is sort of rotating as one, you can think of it as one solid body. So you've got the sun and you've got this, this extended corona, but the whole thing is, is turning together just like one solid shape. Mm. When you come on the other side of this, this critical region or this transition point, that's when um, now the plasma is, it's sort of, if you imagine that the material itself kind of grabs the magnetic field and accelerates outwards. So we, we describe it. It almost seems like a phase transition to me. I mean, I'm, that may not be appropriate, but it seems like a liquid to gas transition almost. It, it, it's certainly a phase transition. Um, it's going from, from like very constrained where the magnetic field is dominant. So instead of a sort of ga- a liquid to gas, it's really like a magnetic field to plasma region. So instead of the magnetic field being dominant, the plasma is now dominant, grabs the magnetic field and accelerates out with it. Interesting. Fascinating. Well, it has been really illuminating to talk to you, Dr. Fox. I really appreciate you giving us your time. And we will check back hopefully before a thousand years has elapsed to see what what you learn next. And uh, that would be great. Thank you so much for uh, for contributing the science to the community. Thanks. All right, take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.